from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton and I'm your host. And tonight, for the first part of the program, we're going to be talking about the Fairfax budget. And I am very pleased to say that we have with us tonight Sharon Bulova. She is the chairwoman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. She is well known as the budget maven. If there is a budget question out there, Sharon is your woman. And so I'm thrilled to have you with us tonight, Sharon. Thank you, Bettina. It's great to be with you. And I, this is the first time I've been called Maven. So. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's true. People are always saying how you know numbers and you know budget and you really are keeping us on sound footing. So I think that's important. Oh, thank well, let's you. talk just a little bit so that people understand what this process has been. I know the county executive introduced a budget back in February sometime. What's happened since then? The county executive introduces his budget the end of February. After that, uh, there are many opportunities for people to learn about the budget through community meetings, budget forums, all over the county. Mm -hmm. I think altogether there have probably been about maybe um, 20 to 30 meetings, uh, budget meetings. Uh, all over the county, different formats. Uh, each supervisor hosts something or maybe several uh, venues within their district. Uh, the next thing that happens are budget hearings, and that starts next week. Uh, this will be April the 8th, or the, uh, the 8th, 9th, and then the 10th. And, uh, and so we will begin public hearings after our board meeting uh, towards the end of the day on the 8th and then we will uh, have board uh, have budget um, public hearings again the next day starting at three o'clock and going until we've heard from uh, I guess about 50 people or so and then on the last evening uh, we will have as many people speak uh, as who would like to speak on the on the budget so there's a lot of community opportunity to weigh in to become involved to engage and also there's a lot of information on the county's website. So if you go to www.fairfaxcounty.gov slash DMB, Department of Management and Budget, uh, you can find just about everything you want to know about the budget and also weigh in. Now if, if citizens want to testify at these public hearings, can they testify each night and do they sign up at the county website that you just gave? They sign up at the county website. Uh, they can sign up online. They can also call. Uh, if you are an individual, you have three minutes to speak. If you are representing an organization, you have five minutes. And you don't get to um, speak every night. So you have, you have one opportunity. Uh, although I will say that there are individuals who may come wearing different hats. And so they may belong to an organization and to be, uh, to be speaking on behalf of that organization as the president or uh, spokesperson. Uh, but then you might see that person coming and speaking as an individual about something as well. OK. Now, you adopt the final budget at the end of April, so then it's all done. That's correct. We mark up the budget. Mark up means that we amend the advertised budget. Uh, that happens, and the only thing on our agenda that day, uh, that happens on April the 22nd. So our board meetings are on Tuesdays. Uh, the week before that, we will have a final budget committee meeting of members of the Board of Supervisors. And uh, I will be putting on the table Sharon Bulova's suggestion for how the advertised budget could be and should be amended mm -hmm. as a result of the public comment that we've had. Uh, but also as a result of my meetings with each member of the Board of Supervisors. 
So I'll go from board member to board member to board member. And uh, by Friday, before budget markup, uh, I will put on the table uh, pretty much the, you know, the, um, you know, the totality of what I've heard and what I've felt. So it's all a very public process. People can come and they can watch sausage being made. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we know how bad that is. And then uh, after markup on February the 22nd, uh, a week later on Tuesday the 29th, we'll do the formal adoption of the budget. Okay. So let me ask because the other budget that I think impacts the Fairfax budget that hasn't been decided yet is of course the state budget. So what happens if the state budget isn't finalized by the 22nd or the 29th of April? Um, that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think it would be. <laughs> and it, it does uh, introduce an element of um, you know, uh, uncertainty into our deliberations on a final, a final budget adoption. Uh, our really uh, critical date for us to, uh, to know what the, what the state is going to do is the beginning of May. Uh, because the schools need to know how much they're going to be receiving from the state in order to then, uh, you know, contract with teachers for the next for the next school year. Um, but this is not the first time that this has happened. Right. So we've dealt with uh, conflict regarding the state budget before, mm -hmm. and uh, and we'll we'll work with them and work with that in order to uh, make sure that um, you know we're you know, uh, as working as closely as we can with members of the General Assembly and the Governor's office. Well, let's talk about education because, and, and I must say, when you say you can get all kinds of information on the budget on the website, it is an amazing amount of information that is out there. And I did want to hold up so everybody can see it. Yes. This is the Citizen's Guide, and I picked this up at the Hunter Mill Summit when the budget was being discussed. And this is a very easy, you know, sort of top level read of the budget. So people who are interested really should get their hands on this, and it is on the website in electronic form. Form, as well as the whole big budget um, package with demographics in it and all kinds of great information for Fairfax. Is this, on that, that is an easy read, and so that's a quick guide as it's as it's uh, titled. Um, but then, if if someone is a real budget wonk mm -hmm. or is just really interested in getting into the weeds of different programs and services, you can find uh, on the budget or on the budget in the budget documents or online information like how many people are served, uh, what has been the success rate of this program, uh, how many people are providing this service, and you can sort of track it over the years. Mm -hmm. it, it really, I think our budget staff uh, just do an outstanding job. They actually do. Let's talk about the quality education as your number one priority. How is the Board of Supervisor defining it? Because the budget advertised says there would be a 2% increase in the transfer from the county budget over to the school system budget. The school board is saying, ooh, we would like 5.7% or something. So they appear to have a different definition of quality education than the Board of Supervisors does. What, what, is the, what are the markers that what you are, look for? And what are the dynamics? Right. Uh, every budget has its own personality. Uh, and the dynamics are different. Uh, we are at the, you know, still not uh, recovered fully from the Great Recession, mm -hmm. and there were there were times where Fairfax County gave the schools all of the new revenue that we had received. So if there was any kind of an increase in any kind of revenue source, mm -hmm. that was given to the schools, and then we would dig into the county side of the budget to give them more if that was what we felt you know, were, they, they needed. Mm -hmm. So um, these have been difficult years, and, and on the county side and also on the school side, uh, we've made some pretty significant reductions. On the county side, during the past recession and its aftermath years, we've made reductions of about $200 million. Uh, and that's not to say that the schools haven't also. Uh, made some reductions on the school side. So we're still struggling, mm -hmm. and I think everyone uh, feels 
that, you know, isn't it over yet? And right. can't we, <laughs> we <get along. laughs> go back to normal? And, you know, we are, we're just experiencing a different kind of normal, and it's, it's going to be a struggle. Well, I noted in the documents, because they are full of information, that the county executive is projecting a revenue growth of something less than 4%. So giving the school board the full amount that it wants it seems to me, just sort of in reading this, that it means other parts of the county government are going to have to suffer in order to make that up. How not, does that play out? Not only that, but if we were if we were going to give the schools the amount that they're asking for, mm -hmm. uh, it it not only would be difficult, you know, because you know we're giving them everything, you know, Plus. of all of the increase uh, on the that could be, uh, you know, also uh, could also fund county programs, and mm -hmm. and let's face it, our employees also right. have not had increases in their compensation, uh, and they're also struggling with health care costs and things like that. But what it also means, and this is this really gets down to the to the nugget of the difficulty of this particular budget year, um, the only revenue. Mm -hmm or potential revenue that we're seeing increase is residential real estate. Mm -hmm. So market values are up. Right. You know, what you could sell your home for is up. And so therefore, your assessment is up. If we were just to keep the tax rate steady at what it is right now, mm -hmm. that would mean that the average taxpayer would see an increase in their taxes right. of $330 annually. And so if we were to try to you know, increase the tax rate by more than that, boy, that's, that's tough on taxpayers. Well, and I guess that was one of my other questions, because the advertised budget didn't increase the proposed tax rate, which is what the Board of Supervisors had said, when you prepare this budget, right. don't do that. And then you've now advertised a possibility of a two cents increase, which then adds even more to the residential property owners. So how does that, you got, there's a lot of competing uh, desires here. Each um, penny on the tax rate, so if we were to increase the tax rate by one penny, right now it's a dollar eight and a half. Uh, if we were to increase it to a dollar nine and a half, that would impact your average homeowner's bill by an additional fifty dollars okay. annually. So if we were to take it all the way to the two cents mm -hmm. increase that we had advertised, then you're you're taking the three hundred thirty up another hundred dollars. Wow. Well, we are going to go to break, and then we are going to come back to continue this conversation with Chairman Sharon Bulova with the Board of Supervisors. So please stay with us. This is a big topic, and we're going to continue after the break. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults. Educación para niños y adultos. Immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals. Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos are a small part of what we do. son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer, para ayuda, información o para ofrecerse como voluntario contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia Helping everyone participate more fully in American society. ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Would you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 
20 million people have chronic kidney disease, and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor, and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for free brochure. But when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half we're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton, your host, and we are here with Sharon Bulova. She is the chairwoman of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors, and we are talking about the budget. And we were talking about the education part of the budget when we went to break in the uh, potential increase in real property taxes for the residents in the county. And I wanted to ask you, because I read this statistic recently that said only about 25% of the people in Fairfax County have children in the public schools. So, and I don't anymore, I did, but mm -hmm. mine are gone. So now I could say, I don't have kids in the public schools, why do I have to do this if 75% of the people don't have children in the public schools? How come we keep giving more than half of our county budget to schools? And what about folks in my age bracket? I'm creeping on up there. And from what I read in all of the materials on the website, older folks are becoming an increasingly big part of the Fairfax County population. So how do we justify 25% of the population is getting more than 50% of our budget? Um, really good question, and I, I too think that that is a really interesting statistic, that so few of the families uh, or the individuals who live in Fairfax County actually at this time have uh, a, a child or children in the school system. I, I uh, have uh, three little grandchildren. One is big, a big grandchild. <laughs> I was, I was thinking, I don't know Alex is that. way taller than me. He's 17 years old, and, and the baby, the, the little one, is, uh, is just four years old. Wow. So uh, a, a spread. So we're going to be uh, getting our money's worth out of the school system for a while. And of course, both of my children went to school, graduated from Robinson. Um, even though so many of our residents do not have children in the school system, mm -hmm. chances are they have, like I, uh, at one time had kids who went through the school system and benefited from that good education. Uh, when we put bond referendums for schools out to, uh, to the voters, uh, they pass overwhelmingly. I think we have a very well-educated community in Fairfax County that understands the value of education and its effect on the quality of life in Fairfax County. Um, I like to describe it as a pyramid. At the top of the pyramid, as far as services and programs go, is education. It's a relatively small percentage of people who directly benefit, mm -hmm. but it makes everything else work. So if you have a well-educated community, uh, you have folks who make better choices and decisions, you have a safer community where you don't need to have, uh, or you don't have the public safety problems that mm -hmm. you do in other places. Uh, industry wants to locate here because they can find the workforce that they need for good jobs, for kids who graduate, uh, for adults, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they make a good salary because, uh, because industry that locates here looking for a well-educated workforce brings along with them this kind of salaries that, uh, that, that we have in Fairfax County. So it really is the, the top of the pyramid is education. And people get that. They're willing to invest in it. Uh, and I rarely hear people at public meetings uh, say otherwise. They understand the value of education. Well, I heard a very interesting comment at the Hunter Mill Summit that I was at. And then I was at a meeting uh, last week someplace else, and someone said, well, this bonding issue, you referenced the bonding, this bonding issue. We are in a zero interest rate environment, and so why don't we just go out and do a couple extra billion dollars and tie it in at this low interest rate environment and just get caught up on all the capital improvements and the things that we need? Why don't we just do that? 
that's that's sort of a simplistic idea. I, I thought it was, but I'm like, well, let me throw it out there since I've heard it twice now. The uh, Fairfax County, uh, we we adhere to the ten principles of financial management, which which guides how much debt we're going to have, and it's just like a family. It's just like a family with your credit card. How much debt can you afford before you go tilt? Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, we restrict how much debt we can have outstanding, uh, how much debt service we can afford in, you know, through our, our budgets. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and because of that discipline, that the Board of Supervisors has has uh, uh, had over the years. We've been able to have a triple, triple A bond rating from the major bond uh, industries. Mm -hmm. So it's it's Fitch and Moody's and Poor and, uh, and so that gets us interest rates that are very, very low mm -hmm. and saves us tens of millions of dollars uh, in interest that we, you know, that we save on because of of our of our um, excellent uh, credit rating. So that's worth something, and so we're we're careful, we're we're disciplined about how much debt we have, mm -hmm. so that we are are not overextending ourselves. Okay. Well, I, I had assumed that that was the answer because I remember there was quite the panic a year or so ago with the sequester and what was that going to do to our credit rating. Right. And it seemed to me that even if you could find people to agree to bond out a couple billion dollars that the credit agencies were not going to look really favorably on right. that. So. Especially Moody's uh, was, you know, looking looking at us mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he's sort of, you know, aligning us with the federal government, which was unfair because the board of supervisors has has uh, established really sound policies for making sure that we are budgeting conservatively, uh, that we are, you know, that we have the intestinal fortitude when we need to raise the tax rate and not pretend that we can do things that we can't afford and then end up with deficit spending. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've, you know, we. You know, we we feel that we you know were unfairly put into that category. Well, let me ask you because one of the other uh, comments in the documents I looked at talked about the need to diversify revenue sources, and there's been a lot of chit chat about meal yes. taxes again. So, what's the deal? You need a referendum. The board of supervisors needs to initiate it, or 10 percent of the voters, I guess, have to do it. Is the Board of Supervisors actually looking at that? Is that something that you're saying, well, it'll get us tens of millions of dollars, let's do this, or no? A meals tax, uh, if we were to adopt it at the same level that most of our sister jurisdictions uh, do, would bring in about $80 million. That's a lot of money. So that is a, a good chunk of change <laughs> and exactly. would be very helpful. Uh, in diversifying our revenue, uh, mm -hmm. as you just described, uh, in Fair in uh, Virginia, we only have certain revenues that local government is allowed to have, and we are a county. Uh, towns and cities have other revenue sources than we do uh, that they can that they can just adopt, and one of those is a meals tax. So a city or the, the little town of Herndon mm -hmm. can have a meals tax, which they do. They can just right. vote to do it. Uh, but we have to put it to referendum. And the fear is putting a question to referendum, as we've done, what, about 20 years ago? Mm -hmm. it, was, it was in the 1990s. Right. Uh, without a really solid plan for how we're going to use it, and, uh, and the kind of campaign to you know, bring people's uh, awareness to the issue and the strong support of you know uh, individuals and organizations within the county uh, without that I would I fear it would fail mm -hmm. and so I favor I've I've been in favor of putting a meals tax to referendum but I think we need to have the right package and we need to do a proper job and we need partners, mm -hmm. organizations to help carry the water to, uh, to reach out to the community uh, to encourage the passage. The Chamber of Commerce is not in favor 
of a meals tax. Mm -hmm. The restaurant industry right. has let me know and let us know that they would fight it. And so all the more reason for if and when we put that question to the voters that we make sure that we've done a really good job of explaining how it would be used and, ex and making sure that that is what, uh, what would find favor among the voters. Well, I have heard really that meals tax idea pushed specifically by certain members of the school board who have said, we should put it out there and we should have an agreement with uh, the Board of Supervisors that said if we do a meal tax, half of the money goes to capital improvements in the county and half of it will go to the school board for capital improvements. Is that an idea that even makes any sense? I mean, I have some question about that, but is that something that makes sense? It might get you that constituency to push for it if you tied it into schools directly? I think that's an interesting idea, uh, although I, I have to say that other groups also advocate for a meals tax and want to have it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> for, it all has to for be instance, dedicated yes, to that. Yes, the housing right? community, affordable right. housing folks would like to, you know, would like us to uh, put a referendum, you know, to the voters uh, to raise money uh, for housing, mm -hmm. and and there are other things, uh, public safety, and um, I'm trying to think of some of the other groups who I've heard from who would like. And then there's tax relief. Uh, if we had another source of revenue, we could reduce the the impact mm -hmm. on our voters of the of increasing the uh, the real estate tax. So it could be used to counter. Uh, and reduce the real estate tax, but then it wouldn't give you the new revenue right. that uh, that the schools and public safety and the parks and the housing folks are looking for. So it's not as easy a job as you would think. Mm -hmm. The town of Vienna uh, has a meals tax and they use that for infrastructure, as you just mm -hmm. described. So they, they use that money, they can leverage it because then you can uh, can bond that stream of revenue mm -hmm. to pay for their streets, to pay for their fire stations, to pay for school facilities. I think that sounds like an interesting, actually an interesting way, uh, a good way of maybe using that funding. It could help the schools, it could also help some of our other needs. Okay. Well, we have about a minute left because we've sort of been talking lots of lots of different areas. But I wanted to talk because you've got this pin yes. on about the World Police and Fire Games. What is that, and when's it coming up? I know it's supposed to be here in Fairfax next next summer. So the World Police and Fire Games are the the second largest international athletic competition after the Summer Olympics. And they're coming to Fairfax, so we bid for it. We're excited. It's going to be a huge deal. It'll be next summer. Okay, and why don't, because I can hear the music, so I know we're going out. What's the website? There's got to be a website for this. Uh, Fairfax 2015. Great. So people can go there and people get People can go info. and well, find and out. We'll have you come do. back and talk about that since we ran out of time Definitely. tonight. Stay with us. We will be right back after this break to talk more budget. turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your social security statement of your benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much social security you're eligible to receive, 
and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement. Because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. We're back so, to the inside who has a drug problem now. And again, your host. Find out how meth Welcome back to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton. I'm your host, and we are still going to talk about the Fairfax County budget, but we have switched guests. We have someone different in the chair, and this time it is Karen Concher, who is with the SEIU Virginia 512, which, for those who don't know, is an employee union. So welcome to the show. This is your maiden voyage, Karen. I appreciate you coming. Thank you very much for having me. So tell me, who does SEIU represent? So SEIU Virginia 512 uh, represent Fairfax County government employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also represent the deputy sheriffs of Fairfax County, Loudoun County government employees, and home health care across the state. Okay, so we've got a proposed budget out there. They've got, they kept the tax rate the same. Uh, There's a proposal to maybe have more um, revenue with a 2% increase, but that's not final yet. So how are the employees feeling about this? The employees did not get a raise for at least a year, maybe two years. So what's the feeling? Uh, Fairfax County employees are very dismayed by the, the of the proposal of the county exec of only allowing for a 1.29 percent market rate adjustment. Um, we have gone without a pay system since 2009. Prior to that, we were on the pay per performance system. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that system, Fairfax County employees were graded based on their ability to do their jobs and the ability to save money or uh, do things in a better way. Unfortunately, for the lower grades and the minorities, that isn't always possible. When you're under a pay performance system, how do you mow a park lawn in a better way than you know the way you've been doing it for eons? So those particular lower grades and minorities were left behind under that system, as well as the system itself didn't even allow for the market changes. Um, Fairfax County employees were left behind approximately 10% of the market across the jurisdictions that we compete with. So we're seeing an exodus of the best and the brightest to other jurisdictions that have a pay plan that works for their employees. So how does it then work if you are an employee of Fairfax County, Mm -hmm. you haven't gotten a raise, is there actually a system in place for people to get raises? It sounds like it's broken. Yeah, at this point in time there is no system in place for an employee to get a raise. We can only get market rate adjustments, which are similar to cost of living adjustments. It's based on the CPI. Uh, The board several years ago approved that formula, which we supported. But we're working with the board right now on crafting a plan that would be fair and equal and provide employees a path through which to move with their career and allow them to maintain their job. Um, well, how yeah. is it? Because I, I was reading these various documents that are on the county website, and I saw the figure that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. And then I saw something about a market rate adjustment for firefighters, and they're going to get like 3%. And I don't want to start a union war here. No, actually. But you just said that the Fairfax employees are about 10% behind other neighboring jurisdiction. How do you go about then getting the kind of market rate adjustment that the firefighters seem to have gotten? Um, So what happens is Fairfax County, when they do their markets, so the market rate adjustment is based based mainly on the CPI and the employment costs. Um, They also take a look at the actual jobs that everybody does, 
and they see what our surrounding jurisdictions are paying. We call those market studies. They're, okay. a, they're very similar to market rate adjustments, but they're market studies for the position. Uh, the firefighter's position was found to be below the corridor. We look for a 95 to 105%, 105% uh, pay equal to the surrounding jurisdictions, and their positions were found to be under. So in order to keep in the market, mm -hmm. the county then moves the scale based on that study, and when they're moving the scale, the employees get to move somewhat with that move. Okay. So if they're looking at the firefighter, in this particular case, the firefighters were found to be around 92%. Mm -hmm. So they're moving their scale and then rewarding them all with the 3% if they've been here a short amount of time. If they've been here longer, they'll only receive a 1.5% one, 1. increase. So, oh, so it's, it's based to... on what your salary is okay. when they take a look at it. Unfortunately for General County, because we do not have a step and grade that most public employees have mm -hmm. because of the pay per performance system, the county only looks at what we call the midpoint of the salaries. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because we've been in pay per performance, 60% of our employees are below that midpoint. So they're not even making that dollar amount that the county is using to conduct their studies. Well, why doesn't the county, I mean, the county keeps talking about how essential the employees are and how we have these great employees and all of this stuff. If we're being so uncompetitive, why isn't this adjustment being made? Is it just coming down to dollars and saying, we don't have it in the budget, so you, there's nothing we can do for you? That's kind of what we've heard for the last four years. Is, and we, as general county employees, understood that, that you know, we, at times were tight. Mm -hmm. Not everybody could you know, be paid what they were worth. Unfortunately for general county employees, we're currently looking at about a 7,500 uh, workforce, 75 people in the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, but 1,081 of those positions are vacant and have been vacant for at least 18 months. So not only have we cut the pay, we've increased the workload. Mm -hmm. We have procurement officers carrying 50 contracts each we have human service specialists just so backed up they can't take lunch, they can't take their breaks, they are just there to serve the people most in need. And you know, for our uh, community services board, you look at the, the, the budget throughout the years, they have seen a 60% increase in the need of their services they have only received a 0.8% increase in the last five years. So we're constantly being challenged to do more with less, mm -hmm. but we're not feeling the support that we feel we need from the board. Well, it, the, the Community Services Board, because that's the mental health that's people, correct. and that has been so in the news in the last six months because of what happened with Senator Credede's family and all of that. Mm -hmm. it, are they getting more of that money back this time? Is there some, you know, the firefighters are getting more. Is the CSB getting more? Um, well, in this particular budget, uh, the transfer, uh, you know, the amount being allocated to the CSB is only a 2% increase. Every, you know, they're not seeing that increase to cover the increased amount of uh, assistance needed to our citizens of Fairfax County. Um, that's a great concern with us. Uh, we understand there's been some changes in work, uh, work times, and the way the work is being done. And we don't feel that that's really sufficient to provide those services that are needed so desperately, not only just in Northern Virginia, but as Cree Deeds pointed out, it's across the state. Yeah. Um, we're not, Virginia is not standing up when it comes to helping those in need. 
Well, that's pretty clear, I think, what we, we, we've seen in the debates down in the legislature in terms of the money going f towards mental health that then needs to filter down into Absolutely. the counties. Well, what, what do the employees want to see done? Is it just give me more money? Is it or a new system or what? Well, Fairfax County employees really want to have a, a system that they can count on, a pay plan that can move them forward through the scales so that they feel like they're going somewhere and not staying stagnant or not falling behind. As the chairman uh, just noted, you know, we have had seen increases in our health care. Um, that has been, you know, such a large increase that it literally has taken away the little bit of percentages that have been uh, received in the past five years. So, you know, we would like to see some type of movement in the scale. We also would like to see support for what we do. Um, you know, the CSB, uh, going back to them, they're looking at 48 vacant positions, um, and 26 of those have been vacant for longer than 36 months. They need the help. Our libraries uh, have had their budget cuts, mm -hmm. uh, the material cuts, um, and they would like to start getting back to being a quality library. I used to live in Fairfax County, um, but now I live in another county, and what I find interesting is I can go to my county's library, and my county has a much smaller budget, and I can find those bestseller titles in my library, and I cannot find them in Fairfax County. No, you know, actually, I use the library a lot, and I was very frustrated when the hours got cut back, but you're also right. I've noticed that I can't find new titles there. That's very disturbing. Yeah. Well, let me um, ask you, the chairman talked a little bit, I asked about meals tax. Mm -hmm. Are there other revenue bases that you think the county needs to look at to come up with more money? Uh, yeah, we believe that the county needs to look at the BPOL tax or the Business Professional Occupational Licensing Tax. Mm -hmm. uh, we are considerably lower than the surrounding jurisdictions. Um, I would even say, go to say that we are approximately uh, one-third the cost of what our surrounding jurisdictions, most notably Loudoun and Prince William. Um, there are different levels of tax included in that BPOL, and it was interesting, a friend of mine runs a very small business, um, and she went to pick up, her, went to pay her BPOL tax, and when she walked out of there, it, she was very upset because her tax was two-thirds more than what a builder or a developer would pay in this county. Wow. So she was paying considerably more for, than a builder or a developer, and to be honest, they're the ones that, while, make, while they support the county's growth, they also, you know, make, make a lot of money. money. Make <laughs> the make best money, money out, of out of it. So, wow. you know, looking at that BPOL tax, I think there are many lines on that uh, okay. list that could be adjusted just to be on par with the surrounding jurisdiction. If they were to do that, that would bring in approximately 51 more, 51 million dollars more to support both General County and our schools. Wow, that's uh, phenomenal because that is a lot of money and I hadn't heard anybody talk about the deep hole tax. And it's distressing for me to think I pay more on it than developers and the contractors do. But I Absolutely. want to thank you for coming, Karen. We will talk again. Okay, thank you. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. 
What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm, fashion, flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. To the inside because scoop. kids who understand again, our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. Welcome back to Inside Scoop Virginia. I'm Bettina Lawton, your host, and we are closing out the show tonight with Marcus Simon. He is a delegate in the House of Delegates in Virginia from the 53rd District. He is a brand new delegate. He's just finished his very first session. So we're gonna talk about what's that all about. It seemed kind of dysfunctional, uh, although the House of Delegates always seems dysfunctional to me. But find out what Marcus has done, and then I also wanna find out about this state budget because the delegates were down in Richmond again in a special session trying to figure that out. So welcome back, Marcus. Thank you, it's glad to be back. So what was it like? Did you get anything accomplished or did you just walk away from your first session frustrated? Well, you know, it's funny. I told everybody uh, my line about this is that I walked in with very low expectations. I mean, being a first year legislator uh, in a minority party, right. when the majority's got 68 seats to R32, uh, yeah, I went in with very low expectations. They were all met. Oh. So, uh, That's meaning, so discouraging. <laughs> meaning I didn't I had, I had, you know, hold out a whole lot of hope, but actually I, was, I, was, I had a very good session. I'd say it was a really successful first session. Mm -hmm. Um, I got two bills uh, under my own name through the General Assembly, which is two, remarkable. More, two more than any other freshman Democrat. So I've got that going okay. for me. Um, I've enjoyed my committee assignments. I'm on uh, the Militia, Police, and Public Safety Committee and the uh, Science and Technology Committee. Well, science uh, and technology is good. The Militia and Police, it seems every freshman Democrat get stuck with that. Yeah, from Northern point. Virginia from in particular. Northern Virginia, they want you in on guns. That's, yeah. that's what so, they want. Um, but you know, there also was a chance to do some substantive work there mm -hmm. too. We worked with um, regulating police forces, campus police officers, what they could do, um, how we would, how um, special police magistrates could identify themselves and the, who could use the word police on the side of their car and who couldn't. And so right. there was some, some nonpartisan sort of good government stuff that we had an opportunity to sort of sink our teeth into. And coming from a local government background, I actually enjoyed um, you know, getting my hands dirty with some of that stuff. That mm -hmm. was that was a lot of fun. What's the issue with, I mean, I have no idea. What's the issue with campus police? What are they doing? Well, no, we, they, so what we need to do is um, to standardize the training uh, requirements for campus mm -hmm. police officers. I mean, they, they carry a badge and in many cases weapons on campus. Uh, so uh, they are now under the um, supervision of, of the same uh, statewide agency that, that, that governs the training of all mm -hmm. police officers. So there's a certain minimum standard they have to um, meet as far as training, firearms training, if they're going to carry a weapon, mm -hmm. um, all those sorts of things. And that was sort of a, uh, an uneven process before. So we've just said that that ought to be standardized. Uh, well, it makes everywhere. a lot of sense considering the violence we've had on our college campuses. You would think they would have upped those standards well, right. and, now. Exactly, and so this is just, like I said, it was just sort of common sense, and we just wanted to bring every, all the stakeholders to the table, make sure we were all on the same page. So what were your bills? Tell me about, so yeah, you bill, got some publicity on pornography. Yes, We talked about yes, that the last time you were uh, here. Yes, uh, yeah, my family is now very proud that you can search Marcus Simon <laughs> pornography, <laughs> and there's a long list of relevant clips um, that, that are come up. I, my, my bill was on what we call revenge pornography, or mm -hmm. revenge porn. Uh, it was House Bill 48, and it was introduced early in the session, actually before the session, we Filed, and I think we, I talked here to you right. about it a little bit with Ken Plum. Uh, that bill is going to be the law. It's passed both the House and the Senate, um, and it's likely to be signed by the governor. Uh, the way the process worked, I, I, people ask me if, right, when I knew that it would probably pass. Mm -hmm. I knew it would probably pass about three weeks after I introduced it when Rob Bell, who's the chairman of the Courts of Justice Criminal Law Subcommittee, introduced a nearly identical bill. Okay. Uh, so that's how a freshman Democrat knows that the bill is probably going to pass uh, when a senior Republican sort of takes a liking to it and, and introduces an almost identical bill. So my bill was combined with Rob's and, and they started out um, almost the same and they came out uh, in a way that I'm pretty happy with. I think the process was very fair. My, I got an opportunity to speak to my bill. I got an opportunity to present 
uh, my witness, my testimony, and mm -hmm. really participate in the drafting of the bill, although it's come out with his number. But the important thing is that it's come out and right. it's passed and it actually is better uh, for going through the process, uh, the committee process. So what uh, made it better? Because you talked about your original bill. So how did it come out of the process? So, so the original we bill, we had sort of a, a, a soft standard as far as it, it, the, the, if somebody was going to post pictures, they had to do it with uh, an intent to cause substantial emotional distress, right. which was sort of a fuzzy way of mm -hmm. thinking about it. It's a lawyer it. phrase. Right. So uh, we've added elements. It's got to be malicious. Uh, it's got to be done. You know, so malice is more of a criminal sort of mm -hmm. a standard as opposed right. to a tort standard. Uh, so there's got to be malice there. There's got to be um, an intent to cause this harm. Uh, and so we just made it a little more concrete, a little easier for a, 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 a judge or a prosecutor sort of tick off the elements. Okay. Um, and this is the context in which we, we can see the malice. This is where we can see that it was done with intent, uh, without permission or without a license to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, as with a lot of things that went through. Also, the means of dissemination, we went through and we sort of modernized those um, because it's not really about photographs or videos mm -hmm. anymore. It's about photographic images. Right. Um, so it's a Facebook, social media, Facebook, social media kind of stuff. So it actually gave us an opportunity to, to improve you know, the definition of what an image okay. was, mm -hmm. uh, how it could be disseminated. And we actually went back um, one section in the in the code. Uh, there's actually already been a, co um, a statute against uh, taking un, you know, sort of the, the peeping Tom video okay. statute, uh, for lack of a better term. And we actually updated and modernized that so that we could update, uh, bring that up into the current um, state of the art. Okay. So again, the committee process was, was good to go through. It was good for the bill, and it was, I think it was good for the law, and, and I look forward to the governor signing that. Excellent. Um, so what's your second bill? So the bill that I got out with my own name on it uh, was a bill uh, the, to streamline our real estate disclosure um, statute. I'm a real estate attorney by trade. Right. This is sort of my wheelhouse. Right. Um, and uh, at closings, I was getting some attorneys that still wanted my clients to sign a certification that nothing had changed uh, regarding the physical condition of the property, mm -hmm. um, as if they had disclosed something about that to begin with. Well, in 2006, we did away with the property disclosure form. And so most sellers know that. don't disclose anything anymore. And that's just, so like, is this a buyer beware It's thing? very much a buyer beware state oh, now. Really? In fact, our new our disclosure form in 2006 really was replaced with what would, would have been called and what most states would call a disclaimer form. Where you say, I'm telling you that I'm not telling you anything. anything. <laughs> the only thing you need to know is don't expect to learn anything from me about the property. Do whatever due diligence you'd like to do yourself. Uh, so that changed in 2006, but this form that gets signed at the settlement table never really got updated. What a lot of us did is starting in 2007, we just stopped using the form mm -hmm. because it didn't seem relevant anymore. But the, the statute technically said you had to have it signed. You know, it, it ought to have been done. So this really just, we took about 28 words. I got a bit of a hard time on the floor because it's my first bill up, but took 28 words out of the code. So we decluttered the code. Very good. Uh, and uh, that one went through with a very little resistance. Uh, the Realtor Association uh, actually backed it and made it one of their report card bills, which helped it through the Senate uh, pretty easily. Well, the realtors are a pretty powerful force in Virginia, yeah, no, so it helps to have them backing a bill that you want. Absolutely. It's good to have friends uh, friends like them. Absolutely. Uh, the other bill that I got passed uh, was a charter change to the City of Falls Church City Charter. Uh, they moved their elections from May to November several years ago. This November, they held their first November election, and they went to organize the city council and realized that the city charter still said they were supposed to wait till July oh, to dear. elect a mayor and a vice mayor and do all those things. So we went ahead and, and made the quick fix to the city charter to say, not only are we gonna have elections in November, we'll now organize in January right. uh, following a November election. So that one was a pretty easy sell. Uh, for my colleagues, and the, right. they, they, I think they thought for a little bit about, well, how can we kill this freshman's bill? But then they said, you know what? <laughs> Whoa. This one's pretty good. This one's pretty common sense. We'll let it go. So did did the false church have to wait until you got that passed to actually get a new mayor? Or uh, no, they, they actually went ahead and did it. What we did is essentially ratified okay. their actions. They had a, a city attorney that said you know, the, the, that part of the code had been... Uh, they relied on the doctrine that it was repealed by implication, okay. which is sort of a weak place to be. Yeah, so. but you know, you got to go with what you can. <laughs> you, you, what can't, you, got sometimes. you can't leave your, your city unorganized right. for six months so, waiting for it. So this was just a little bit of cleanup for that. Um, okay. That was a good thing to get done. Well, that's actually pretty impressive because I always hear about legislators going in and carrying a bill for a local government, and most of the time it doesn't seem to pass. So it's it, because it's just too provincial for everyone right. to get behind. But the, it, these sound like good things to, to be getting done. Well, and, you know, it's funny. The city charter one, they, they, they pulled it out of the block, the uncontested block on the floor. Mm -hmm. And they, they looked like there was a move. They were thinking about killing it because um, there's a group on the, in the Tea Party, the far right, that doesn't like this move um, generally from May to November elections because 
too many of the wrong kind of people will vote in a November yes. election. Uh, but when I was able to stand up and explain that we'd already made that move, that leap from May to November had already happened. This was just right. about organizing it. I'd still got 99 out of 100 votes. No, no, no votes, just 99 people were there that day. Okay. So I had to defend it a little bit, but it got through. Well, I know there's been conversation about people switching from the May to the November, because of course, Vienna and Herndon will both have their elections come uh, first week of, uh, first Tuesday of May. And there's a sort of this feeling that, gee, they just get lost in the shuffle if they did that. So um, I'm surprised to hear that Falls Church went ahead and did it. Cause well, and there did. was some thought that, that you get, would get lost and people wouldn't be focused on the right issues. You'd get right. people that were coming to vote for the governor and wouldn't really understand the city issues and they mm -hmm. wouldn't know who to vote for. Uh, but I think in the end, they actually were really pleased with the outcome. Um, we had a great turnout and there was not a lot of drop off. Um, it's a pretty engaged city. I mean, people are pretty right, engaged in state and local affairs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that actually the, the City, the council feels like they have a, a better, a stronger mandate to pass their budget and to act now that such a large percentage of the right. city actually turned out That's and voted true. for them. That's true. Well, tell me about this special session and Medicaid expansion. Is Now, is Medicaid expansion the only thing hanging up passing the state budget? The, yes, I would say, okay. honestly, if it were not for the need to expand Medicaid to cover 400,000 Virginians who don't currently have health care coverage but could, if we would only accept $5 million every day in federal money, uh, if that weren't an issue to be decided, the, this budget would have been passed uh, back during the regular session. And this is money to restate it, because I'm pretty confident I'm right on this score, but if I'm wrong, tell me. We're already paying that $5 million. so. It's not like your tax rates are going down or you're not going to have to pay money. We have to pay it regardless. It just means that some other state is getting our money, right? That's Isn't that right. How it works? That's right. As a small business owner, I'm paying health care taxes to pay for the Affordable right. Care Act. Uh, we all, it's being paid by Virginians. Virginians are putting that money out. We're sending it to the federal treasury, and we have the opportunity to take it back. Uh, by agreeing to expand Medicaid. In fact, you know, the original program was designed that, where that would be automatic. Uh, the Supreme Court right. ruled um, that you couldn't force states to expand Medicaid. But the thought was, well, why would you need to force them? It's their money coming back. Right. So this, is, you know, this doesn't save us any taxpayer money. It doesn't change um, how much money we pay for the, towards the Affordable Care Act. Um, it doesn't really help up repeal in any sense the Affordable Care Act. Uh, there's no reason not to do it except that I believe uh, the governor campaigned on it, the Democratic right. governor campaigned on it, and the House of Delegates doesn't want to give him a win. Um, and it's, you know, the, it's been championed by the, the, our, our president, who they intensely dislike for whatever reason. Well, how is this going to get resolved? I mean, the Senate came up with some Marketplace Virginia thing, which seems to now have been changed again. I mean, was anything accomplished? You were there last week, I guess. Was so, well, technically, technically, I'm still in session. Right now, we're still in our special session. The governor okay. called it, uh, but it's sort of like if your parents tell you, you know, go to your room and do your homework. Mm -hmm. you know, they said, well, you can make me go to my room, but you can't, can't make, make me, me do, do my, my homework, homework that's right? right? So we, we got together in uh, on a week ago Monday uh, for the session. We actually passed what we call the caboose bill, the bill that finishes up last year's budget mm -hmm. uh, and expends any sort of leftover money. And that part of it's been finished. That was done pretty quickly. Uh, but then the Senate adjourned until April 7th to look at the governor's budget proposal. The governor essentially has come down with a new budget proposal that says, here's one that does Medicaid expansion. All you have to do is take it. Uh, the House said, um, we're going to lay that one on the table. We're going we're to pass that by and we'll introduce our, our same budget again. We're back to square one in the House. Oh, good Lord. That was well, a quick 15 minutes. It always is. It always is a quick 15. And if you ever get anything resolved on the budget, we'll have you back to talk about it some more. I'd be happy to. But thank you so much for coming, Marcus. Oh, I great to see you again. again. All right. Take care.